Thank, thank you so much for the introduction. It's very kind. Uh, thank you for the invitation to the conference. It's been really nice to, to, to be here. I've seen lots of amazing uh, birds outside, um, although apparently they're really boring and no one cares about them. They're like <laughs> no standards. I, I, what's it called? A, 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 a noisy miner. Apparently, I, was, I saw one this morning. I said, that's amazing. But apparently, they're everywhere and no idea. I think the Carl Birds are looking at all these birds. Uh, but, but no one, but, uh, you know, apparently, that's not very exciting. Okay, so, yeah, uh, as you've heard, uh, I'm currently a, a journalist. I quit academia about a year ago because I felt like I wasn't very good at it. And you can, and that's not to claim that I wasn't particularly, I'm, that I'm particularly good at my current job either. But you can decide. Uh, my uh, main credential, I guess, in the field of um, open science replication crisis stuff is that I was there at the very start of the, uh, the Daryl Bem story. Uh, he published this paper in 2011, and I um, immediately uh, tried to replicate this paper. Um, very frustrated for my PhD advisor at the time because it was nothing to do with what my PhD research was on, but I was in, you know, all the afternoons and evenings uh, in the lab running a replication of this of this uh, study, um, and we eventually published it in, a, in, a, in another journal. One of the, one of my better ever jokes, the title of this paper, that I think has is, is gone unappreciated over the years. So uh, that, that's uh, that's what we call that's what we call that, and it caused some uh, uh, discussion at the time because um, we we failed to get it into the same journal that published the original research, and this. Um, you know, obviously raised lots of questions about whether journals are interested in publishing replication at all. We were explicitly told by the editor that they do not publish replication studies. Something which has now changed at that journal, I should, I should say. Um, so, so that's kind of where I got into this. And um, that kind of sparked off that and a few other incidents at the time, obviously sparked off this discussion about the replication crisis. And in that issue of uh, perspectives on uh, psychological science, that I think coined the term replication crisis uh, back in 2012, there was this paper. And as a journalist, I often think about this paper. Um, this paper is, was called A Vast Graveyard of Undead Theories. What a great title uh, for, a, for a paper. I, I, it, it pops into my mind all the time. And it's by Christopher Ferguson and Morris Heen. And um, uh, it's, it's mainly about publication bias um, and about, uh, oh, this is, what Dali gave me when I said, vast graveyard of undead theories. <laughs> um, one of the green, gravestones says undead theories there. I'm not sure if that's what you would do. Anyway, um, uh, uh, and the idea is that there are these theories which have resisted attempts at falsification, ignored disconfirmatory data, negated field replications through the dubious use of meta analysis, or having simply maintained themselves in a fluid state with shifting implicit assumptions such that falsification is not possible. Now, I think we all agree that that's a major problem. That theories, that there are theories out there that shift and uh, um, uh, ignore disconfirming, disconfirming evidence. However, I think this applies more broadly than just to uh, to, to, to theories. And I, I think it, this is a kind of ideal situation in some ways because there is actually evidence out there that can decide whether a theory is, is true. You know, the, the, this this presupposes the existence of disconfirmatory data. But I think we basically live in a world that's much more ambiguous than that. And I think a lot more could be made of this uh, metaphor of the uh, graveyard of undead research or undead studies or undead theories um, than, they, than they do in the paper. We live in a world of needless scientific ambiguity because studies are essentially undead as well. There are studies that are, that, are that cannot answer the question that they are uh, proposed to, 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 to address, um, that could never in a million years do it, because the, 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 either the setup, the statistics, the, uh, the whatever it is that they're, that they're doing, is simply not suited to, to, to do so. So I thought I'd would give you some examples of where I've encountered this. When I've been tasked as a journalist to write an article about a, a particular area of research, whether it's in psychology or elsewhere, I've found that I found essentially a vast graveyard of undead research and, and, and an inability to come to any kind of conclusion, uh, even even if uh, very strong claims are made about it in the media or the scientific literature. So um, uh, that's that picture again. Um, here's a paper. So let's start with a really stupid one. This comes up every year, every summer. Uh, there are dozens of articles published that say. Drinking a hot drink will cool you down, right? This is it's all over the news. I've got on my sub stack there's a list of you know, dozens of articles that say this and that claim this. I looked up to see if there are actually any studies that do this. And I think it's like based on about two studies which have about 18 people in them overall. That, that's where this that's where this comes from. Um, 
it involves a rental thermometer, it involves really, like, it's really a serious research in some ways, but, but in other ways it's not really, because in other ways it, 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 it can't uh, really answer this question, and actually, I mean, it doesn't show that. Drinking a hot drink cools you down, it's such a stupid, uh, such a stupid thing to, 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 to believe. But we, we, we really don't have evidence for that, despite the, the, the common claims. Um, re regularly, there, is, uh, there are claims that our sperm count is declining. There was a book uh, last year, or perhaps the year before, that was everywhere in the media. It was called Countdown. <laughs> I don't know how you would agree, but um, uh, I looked up the evidence uh, last year to see, and I found the patchiest possible evidence base for this claim that you know in Western countries people's sperm counts are are are, are declining. Um, is it the case? So, so every night at eleven o'clock, my uh, iPhone turns like urine yellow. Uh, I don't know if you have the same setting turned on because uh, my understanding was that if you look at too much blue light before you go to sleep it will, uh, or before you go to bed, it will stop you from sleeping. I know lots of people believe that. Apple have got settings on their phone to, to make this happen. Again, you look up the studies and there's about two bits of research and uh, neither of them are particularly conclusive uh, in, in, in any way. Maybe they've got secret commercial research that they've not released yet, but certainly if you look at the, the available research on this, there's basically nothing there. You're basing this whole claim, which you hear all the time, I'm sure you agree, um, on, on the tiniest little scraps. Here's one where there are actually quite a lot of studies, but the studies are, uh, I would argue, and have argued at length, um, really quite flawed in, in, any, in many ways. So um, uh, psychedelics, it, 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 the, 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 there's a massive hype about whether taking things like um, psilocybin, MDMA, and so on can relieve psychiatric symptoms. And uh, um, the, the, I, would, I would argue, and, and can have this discussion uh, with you if you're interested, um, that the, the, the evidence is really nowhere near uh, what we would want to do this, and suffers from really quite serious, serious problems of, uh, of bias. Um, there was an article in Nature just uh, earlier this year about whether cash transfers improve, uh, you know, extend people's lives. So these kind of programs where governments just give people extra amount of money. Um, there was an incredibly ambiguous paper in Nature where there was no pre-registration and they had clearly uh, decided post hoc to do certain analyses here and there. And it was the least convincing study ever. And wouldn't you want to live in a world where you can read a paper in Nature and be convinced that something is, is, is true? Wouldn't you want to live in that world? We, we don't live in that world. Here's one that shocked me recently. In the UK, we have a massive thing about systematic phonics and how uh, phonics is the best way to teach kids how to read. I don't know if that's uh, currently the case in Australia as well. Did you have a debate here? Um, it turns out, and I'll show you in just a moment, um, it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot more ambiguous than that. Um, and then comes parenting stuff. Now, my goodness, if you want anything to do with, uh, if you want to know anything to do with parenting, uh, any of these questions, even basic stuff like, you know, on our, uh, in the UK we have the NHS, these are little recommendations on the NHS website, you should sterilize the baby's bottle every feed for a whole year. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of people did it, a lot of people did it. Um, does uh, things like sleep training to, 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 to make them, uh, to get them to sleep through the whole night. Um, sleep on the front versus the back, baby leg weaning, tummy time, even things like whether breastfeeding is your baby's heart, we'll come back to that, um, are, are uh, massively ambiguous when you look at the research. Either there are lots and lots of studies and they're extremely flawed, or there are just the tiniest scraps of evidence. Um, does anyone want to see a picture of my baby? Yes, yes. I see you, which is two and a half months old. And also that's why I'm interested in this topic. I should, I should say um, that, by the way, if, if you think that the evidence for parenting stuff is bad, you should look at the evidence for any veterinary uh, technique, anything to do with your pet, the quality of the evidence is unbelievably low for any medical intervention, essentially, uh, that, you, that you might want to do there. Um, let's just look at some of those examples in more detail. So um, this paper came out in 2020, and in the British kind of um, educational world, has caused a massive controversy and a dozen blog posts back and forth raging each other and comments, hundreds of comments and, you know, and so on. And what Jeffrey Bowers, who's at uh, Bristol University, did was look at the 13 meta-analyses that have been published on uh, phonics and whether phonics is the best way to teach reading and found that none of them actually have a particularly convincing comparison where you take systematic phonics on one hand and the whole language technique, because the whole thing about the reading wars is that there's systematic phonics versus whole language, right? That's the, that's the reading wars. We've been talking about that for decades. A lot of people have come to the conclusion that the reading wars need to be ended because we've, 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 we've dealt with this now. We know, that we know the answer to this question. 
Turns out we don't. I really recommend reading this paper. I just read it a few weeks ago, and it's a real eye opener um, in, in, in terms of how 13 separate meta analyses of, of studies could all uh, not come up with convincing uh, uh, evidence, despite what you see. So Nick Gibb, who is a, a, a member of the uh, Parliament in the UK and uh, has been in the Education Department basically all the way since 2010, has um, uh, been a big advocate of this and regularly talks about how the phonics, you know, phonics is really a massive success of the current government and, you know, people say we're obsessed with it, but actually it's really good and so on. Um, and there are many academics that support this too. But you read this paper, you tell me that you that you think that there's strong evidence that phonics is uh, is, is 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 actually the best way to teach kids how to read. Um, this is the one about uh, uh, sleeping and and the the the, the um, uh, so some of these are from your your phone. A couple of these studies are from the color of your phone. Some of them are from wearing glasses with a different color. You know, so not even your phones. That's a, it's a slightly different thing uh, anyway. And you see how. Like this is the basis on which uh, you know Apple and other other uh, companies have made their phones change color, and this this whole belief has has has, has come about. That's like Google's point zero four nine or something in the in the in the meta analysis there. Not convincing, not convincing evidence at all. Here's one where uh, this is the breastfeeding intelligence one, which has become kind of a um, an absurd uh, argument because. This is a meta-analysis where they looked at, they did a systematic review meta-analysis of observational studies um, where uh, people who, you know, who breastfed their kids versus people who didn't, and um, uh, they looked, you know, some years later, what the kids' IQ score was, basically. Um, now, there's a major problem there because it's confounded with socioeconomic status in lots of um, Western countries. Um, it's confounded with maternal intelligence, it's confounded with various other different things. Um, and they admit that in the in the paper, they admit that's serious, you know, often unmeasured confounding factor. But then what they say is there's also another randomized, there's a randomized trial which we didn't include in meta-analysis, and it says that it, it's positive. So all this stuff that we put in meta-analysis with all the observational studies actually is probably causal then because of the <laughs> and I find this mind bending not only because the randomized controlled trial has now had a follow-up study, uh, I think the kids are now 16 from that randomized trial, which was in Belarus. And there are no no differences between the best and kids on on uh, an intelligence test. So so um, I, I find the kind of I, I think this is a kind of weird sleight of hands happening here. But again, there are dozens and dozons of studies, and all we've got is this ambiguous. We don't know. No one has done. I think there's maybe one or two studies that have done like a sibling control design, which would be the really you know would be a really good way of, of doing this. They show very very small effects. Um, and as I say, one randomized trial, which wasn't a randomized trial of breastfeeding, by the way. It was a randomized trial of a breastfeeding, um, like, a, um, like an intervention that did more breastfeeding versus less, right? So it's, it's not that they stopped you from doing it in one group and made you do it in another. It was that you, they were encouraged and given more support in one group versus another. So, um, that, could we do that again? Is, are, not, are people not interested? Even if it's not intelligence, people claim loads of benefits of, of, of breastfeeding, whether it's infection and stuff, uh, I development have seen a huge number of different claims. Um, we just don't have any convincing evidence on this. And while we're talking about studies that um, that kind of have have uh, an incorrect design, here's an example of where. So this this is a study funded by the uh, Economic and Social Research Council in the UK to the tune of a quarter of a million pounds. Now that's not. A massive grant. Uh, it's not like a huge, you know, program grant or anything. But you'd be pretty pleased if you got a quarter of a million pounds to do uh, to do a, a, a bit of research. My goodness, that's a you know a decent amount of money, um, a decent amount of taxpayers' money. They did this study called uh, Paternal Involvement and Its Effects on Children's Education. A worthy topic of study. I think that sounds like a very important question to ask. Um, they published a report on it earlier this year, and it turns out that despite all this money being spent and despite all the press releases and, and, and so on. This study is completely useless because it makes the basic error of not controlling for genetics in a study of parenting. Right? You can't do a study of parenting where you just correlate the parenting behavior with the child's outcomes and say it was parenting that caused the outcomes. I mean, first of all, that's a correlation causation error. But, but, but there's, a, there's a glaring confounding factor, which is that parents give their kids genetics as well as parenting, right? So even if there are effects of parenting, and I'm not saying that there aren't, I think there's lots of evidence from proper design studies that there are effects of parenting. But this one couldn't answer the question. 
And when I emailed the author and said, do you think there's a problem with the massive compounding, like glaring compounding issue in your study? She said, yeah, kind of. Is there any reason that you didn't mention that at all in the report that you wrote or in the press releases or anything? Oh, you just get kind of, kind of um, uh, not, not particularly committal uh, uh, response. Um, so there's a study where, this was done in 2023, after decades of behavior genetic research that, that we know that this, you know, we know that this is not a good design for, for looking at parenting effects, and yet, there it is, it was in the, the newspapers. And, um, and I think it's an example actually of, oops, I think it's an example of where scientists can kind of go off into their own little world and do research that's in their own little kind of enclave that's separate from uh, from, from everything else. Um, we heard yesterday about collaboration and transdisciplinary collaborations. I think people people uh, uh, are, are not doing that anywhere near as much as they, as they should, because if, if, if any behavior genet geneticist had been involved at any stage of this process, they would have said, Jesus, maybe this will be wrong. Oh, although once they've started the study, you know, listen, if you say, by the way, this entire thing is flawed, and you need to give the core of a million pounds back to the British government, you know, that's not going to happen. You're very um, so, so I think this is an example of people going off on their own little way. And um, here's another example, which I think is, is a very common thing in psychology, is people going off on their own little way to re-describe research that has previously uh, uh, been, been, been done. So this is uh, Grit. You remember a few years ago, Grit was everywhere. Everyone was talking about Grit. I think the book came out in 2016. Um, uh, New York Times bestseller uh, by Angela Duckworth. Um, huge, huge deal. And it turns out that Grit, the concept measured on the questionnaire, which is what she's using in her studies, correlates like 0.9 or something with conscientiousness from the big five uh, personality test, right? So, so, so it's just a redescription of what we previously knew. Um, but, but there was huge, there was a massive deal made of this. The, 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 you know, the, the, this went everywhere. New York Times editorials, all this. Um, and I think it's an example of um, what's been described as the, the toothbrush problem, which is everyone wants their own little thing. They don't want to use anyone else's, uh, like a toothbrush. I tried to combine the zombie concept with the toothbrush metaphor here again, uh, thanks to, to Dali for making this, this picture. Um, good head hair for something that's dead, I would, I would uh, say. Yes. But um, uh, uh, the, 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 the point is, and, and this, has been, this has been talked about several times, is that people want their own little bit of research, and even if that means producing research that just goes over grounds that we have previously uh, uh, tilled, or um, uh, actually ends up producing, again, an ambiguous evidence-based overall. This is a paper that came out um, just a couple weeks ago on measures in psychology and the number of times specific measures are used. So that great example is where something which we already knew is being redescribed as something different. But here our, uh, it, it is a case where we have concepts that are, that are the same and, and many, many, many different measures are being made. 43% of the measures they looked at, these are you know, questionnaires, tests, you know, all, all this kind of stuff, um, were only used once in, 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 a, in a psychology study, right? Between 1993 and 2022. There are some that are used regularly. Um, the BDI, the, the Beck Depression Inventory, it's used in tens of thousands of studies. It's a very, very common one. But those are, are, are very rare. The, the, you know, it, it's remarkable how many um, uh, studies are used, how many measures are used um, just once or twice. And it really prevents us from doing this cumulative science thing where we're building uh, cumulatively, cumulatively on other people's research. You're instead doing your own thing. You're not wanting to use uh, someone else's toothbrush, um, but, but, you're, but you are in fact building up an evidence base where someone will come along in a few years and be unable to compare the studies. Um, and even when people use the same measure uh, they showed in this paper, it's very common for them to drop a few items out, uh, transform it in a different way, or use it in their aggregate scores in some different way. Use it in a way that actually, even though it looks like it's the same measure, means that it can be compared across different studies. So there's another uh, scary situation. Daniel Dennett, a few years ago, wrote this article about chess. Has anyone uh, read this? So this is a, um, a game which is a bit like chess, um, but it's different in, in, in just subtle ways. I think he describes it as the king can move two squares uh, in any direction rather than one. And um, uh, what a lot of academics do is, is devote their time to studying chess 
when they could be studying chess that has a whole cultural cachet, a historical uh, background. Uh, we have lots of you know lots of people are interested in it and so on. But what academics do is kind of the appearance of studying uh, a question that people are actually interested in. But in fact, they're studying chess. In fact, they're studying something that they've kind of made up their own little field. And it might be very interesting. Chess has rules as well, and you can you know I'm sure chess has lots of openings that you can that you can do and uh, and, and so on. But um, it, it pushes them off into a, into a field that becomes increasingly less relevant to questions that are actually important or are relevant to, to, to people's lives. And um, I worry that a lot of academics have basically made themselves into chess players uh, rather than what we want uh, them, them to be. And we end up in the intolerable, I would argue, situation where um, uh, we end up with just ambiguous evidence whenever people try and review the evidence. Um, I, I would end, I, I would, you know, you end up in this terrible situation where um, you, you you can't find convincing evidence even for medical intervention. I mean, what must it be like in psychology uh, if you if you if you if you uh, if you move this? So medical interventions uh, in this particular analysis, um, five point six percent had high quality evidence supporting their benefits, and and they, this is from uh, the great guidelines when people do a, a, an assessment of quality of studies. Less than six percent, as you know, people describe as having high quality um, uh, evidence. That's a terrifying situation to be in. Um, and no wonder. Uh, by the way, I would say that at least one of the authors in that study has uh, gone a bit mad, and, and that's the same in this. Study. <laughs> and I would say the same for this study. Actually, um, COVID uh, took a toll on many of our scientific heroes. I would say. But um, uh, but, I, I, but I think I think uh, still still makes makes a very good point. This is a study about medical reversals. Now, this is actually, in some sense, a success story because um, we have 396 examples here of where the medical um, uh, uh, received wisdom or the, the, the consensus for what treatment was was one thing, and then a, another study came along, often a large randomized controlled trial, and flipped the consensus altogether. There's 396 examples that they found. Uh, some about what you should do with someone who's just immediately had a stroke, a uh, heart attack, um, there's various different things like that which have, which have flipped entirely. And the problem was that they were based on these, uh, you know, graveyards of very low quality evidence to begin with. And no one had come along and done an actual proper high quality study. The classic example, the paradigm example of this, is, is peanut allergy. Um, this is a review from I think 1996 from the from the, the British government um, that I uh, was really interested to have a read of, and they cite I think a couple of tiny studies, um, neither of which are um, focused entirely on peanuts. They're about um, allergy in general, so they include um, putting bed nets up to, uh, to stop dust from getting into kids' beds, and you know various different interventions that they that they did, and also cutting out peanuts. And they concluded on the basis of these couple of studies, plus I think they sign like a doctor sending a letter to the British Medical Journal and stuff in this, you know, with, with no new evidence provided. Um, uh, they decided that you should not give your kids peanuts because that will, because if you give your kids, you know, in the very early years, if you give your kids peanuts, that will increase their chance of becoming allergic uh, later. Um, we now know that that's completely wrong. We now know that that's the opposite of the truth. And uh, we know that because this study came along in 2015, um, where they studied kids for very many months. They gave uh, um, some of them uh, peanuts on a regular basis from a very early age, so four months uh, uh, onwards. And they had a really rigorous way of measuring, like the, the, the skin test and the size of the kind of wheel that you grow and, uh, and so on when, you, when you're exposed to the peanut. Um, and the evidence is so clear that the kids who um, had were given peanuts. Were were um were, were far less likely to, to develop these large you know allergy symptoms uh, than the kids who who um uh, who avoided them. Um, and there's a medical reversal for you. And now we know we've had, there's there's been subsequent evidence and so on that you know we should be giving kids peanuts uh, early for high risk uh, groups. Right? So this is for when you have a family history of peanut allergy. You know those are that's really important to then give your kid. Uh, uh, peanuts. And that was the opposite up until recently. We were told this by not just the NHS, but by uh, the, the CDC in the, in the US uh, as well. So I, but, I, but, I, but I think this is overall a good, a good news story. Like we can get over the ambiguous low quality evidence space and we can build uh, an actual, you know, we can do high quality trials. 
Um, and here's another uh, example of what happened in, in my own uh, uh, fields or, or one of the you know, fields of psychology that I, that I did some research in behavior genetics. When I was doing my undergrad, everyone was very excited about candidate gene studies. So you would take a particular gene that you thought was theoretically related to some uh, psychiatric condition, normally the most famous one was about depression. Um, there's also one about aggression, there's also, I mean, there's a huge number of different things. You take a gene that you had some kind of biological rationale uh, that you thought it was related to this uh, outcome, and then you would get, sometimes maybe a hundred people, a few dozen, uh, and you would take, do a genetic test, and then you would correlate whether they had the particular allele you're interested in and uh, uh, whatever the outcome was. And there was a massive literature built on this, a huge literature, hundreds of studies uh, uh, on the candidate gene uh, approach. Um, and um, it turned out that it was all for nothing. So this is a study that came along in 2019. This was, the, this was simply the wrong way to do the research. These were all drastically underpowered uh, studies. And when you actually come along and do a high power study where you have there's thousands of people, uh, all genotypes are high quality, you have high quality measures of their psychiatric outcome or whatever it is that you're, you're interested in. This is a study that looked at all the different genetics, uh, and the gen all the different specific genes that people think were related to depression, um, either in or in, uh, either in combination with uh, childhood trauma or, or not, because that was some of the theories, is that you have this gene and childhood trauma and it massively increases your likelihood of getting depression. Um, and I mean, look at it, there could be a, a more convincing slate of no results there. <laughs> and famously, um, there was an article written, which you know the authors of this study described this article as it's amazing when someone writes an article that describes your own research better than you can. And there was this article on the Slate Star Codex blog that said, what well, bothers me isn't that people just said that the 5 HTT LPRs, that's one of the genes that's famously related to depression, um, mattered and it didn't. It's that we built whole imaginary edifices, whole castles in the air on top of this idea. We figured out how uh, 5 HTT LPR exerted its effects, what parts of the brain it was active in. I mean, people did neuroscience studies that uh, were talking a huge extent. Um, what sorts of things it interacts with, how its effects were enhanced or suppressed by the effects of other imaginary depression <laughs> genes. This isn't just an explorer coming back from the Orient and claiming there were unicorns there, it's the explorer describing the life cycle of unicorns, what unicorns eat, all the different subspecies of unicorns, which cuts of unicorn meat are tastiest, and a blow by blow account of a wrestling match between unicorns and big food. And so I, 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 I worry that we might be doing this in lots of other areas of research if the studies are so low quality. Like, what, what came along in behavior genetics was the genome-wide association study era where it suddenly became much cheaper, the technology improved, it suddenly became much cheaper to genotype many thousands of people at once. And well, once we were able to do that, we could simply very straightforwardly see that these genes were just not coming up in relation to the particular disorders that we're interested in. Um, has that technological increase or that, um, you know, increase in the quality of research happened in X, Y, Z field that you are interested in? Who, who knows? Here's one field where I think it happened. I don't know why that's not great. Here's one field where I think it has happened. I think we can be positive to say that it has happened in um, uh, brain imaging research. Um, you look back just a couple of decades, and brain imaging research was again massively expensive to do. Tiny samples of people, in the, you know, in the in the in the tens, sometimes dozens, you know, maybe a few hundred. And you got very unreliable associations for it. You try to associate you know, I don't know, a particular personality factor with how big this region of someone's brain is or whatever. Um, I think this paper, which was in Nature last year, I think it goes a little bit far by saying you require thousands of individuals for everything, because obviously it depends on the size of the effect that you're interested in. If you're interested in a big effect, then you don't need that many people. Um, I guess the, 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 the question is that you know, we're often not interested in big effects, we're interested in quite, quite modest effects, um, because we don't expect to find a massively strong correlation between the size of this particular brain region and, uh, um, again, pressure or something like that. But, um, but I think what this shows us is that we're now at the point where we have access to large-scale studies you know, with brain imaging data, uh, like the UK Biobank, where we have, uh, we're eventually going to have 100,000 people with brain images in it. That was the same study that allowed us to do these genome-wide association studies. It's got half a million people um, with their genomes uh, uh, and so on. There, there are other studies that are building up now right across the world that, uh, that we can you know, we can rely on much more. So there are some positive stories of where some sciences have actually improved their, their obviously, 
there are many questions still to ask, and we're not like it's not like we've solved you know brain imaging or anything, but we've made progress, and, and I think we can try and learn some lessons from these areas where we've kicked out the the, the previous rubbish paradigm. I mean, in psychology, to some extent, we've done that too. I mean, look at the replication crisis. Social priming, all that stuff about you see a word and then it changes the way you act, you walk it more slowly down the corridor and so on. The way we dealt with that was yes, some field of replication attempts, but also just loads of ridicule for years, and that seemed to work. Um, so, so maybe that's a way of, of, of fixing the low quality science. And you know, even before the replication crisis discussion started, Walter Michel, who uh, I have many disagreements with. Uh, he's the marshmallow test guy. Um, uh, I believe there's no such thing as personality, uh, or certainly not the you know, traits that the, 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 the last. Um, lots of disagreements, but he wrote this amazingly, turns out really prescient, and there was, there was some from 2008 uh, as well, um, articles on building a cumulative science, that we want to be able to you know, produce research that we can rely on, that we can actually use as a foundation, that is not this unstable foundation that we have where anyone coming along you know, wants to ask a question, sees sometimes that there are hundreds of studies, but then they crumble to sand when you actually try and pick them up. Um, so, you know, the sort of lessons that we can have are very, very, I think this, I'm not, I'm not revealing anything, you know, new or exciting here. We know all the stuff about questionable research practices and, 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 and so on. We've been through that a million times. But sometimes it just takes someone to do a really simple, straightforward trial of some kind of medical intervention or some kind of randomized in, in, in intervention, and it can sometimes flip the evidence altogether, especially if that evidence has been pieced together from little bits of observational research here, a mouse or a rat study there, uh, a, you know, a brain imaging research here, and, you know, and, and, and so on. Increasing the sample size uh, is, is, has worked in, you know, in genetics and neuroscience to, to, to sweep away the previous uh, paradigm uh, in, 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 in many ways. And it was really as simple as that, but it took a technological intervention and took lots of you know, uh, uh, advances in that, in that respect. Has it happened in your field? And actually just doing replications of, of previous claims. I mean, uh, again, it's, it's so straightforward, it's so boring and obvious, but just doing the same study that someone else has done will sometimes uh, will sometimes reveal uh, as what we found out right at the start of the crisis. I'm preaching to the community. Yeah. Um, some other ideas. Um, I, uh, I like the idea that um, Daniel Lackins had this thing during the pandemic, but I also think it applies more generally about uh, recruiting people deliberately to trash your research. And because we can't rely on the peer review process because peer reviewers are busy and got their other things to do and uh, so on. So pay people to come in and and say, you know, find the flaws in your in your in your research. Have that as part of your research plan. We'll pay people to read this research and uh, and and, uh, and 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 trash it as much as we possibly can. That's what we need. This book, The Scout Mindset, um, is all about making a virtue to change your mind about stuff and admit that you got stuff wrong. You know, we all get stuff wrong all the time. And and and, and um, I think scientists who, uh, with some of these areas, are areas where scientists are just not willing to admit that they got something wrong and, and, and end up digging further and further and further into this area, whether it's the candidate gene research or whatever, whatever else it is, without saying, look, hands up, I just, we just got this wrong and we need a new, a new uh, way of doing this research. I think collaborations are so important. I mentioned this earlier. That if someone who's a behavior geneticist had come along to that study of fatherhood uh, and says, even something very basic, and um, that would have, that would have uh, I, I don't know what the way of pushing people into more interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research is, but, but that's something we need to really focus on, I think. Uh, this whole, um, you know, people go off into their little side and end up doing loads of research, uh, and then years later it's found that all that research is fundamentally flawed. That can't be the way to do things. Or you could go completely over the top. Now, this brings us full circle to parapsychology, the Daryl Ben paper obviously was about psychic powers, that, that paper that put up right at the start but, uh, from 2011, it was about uh, whether Cornell undergraduate students could uh, sense the future uh, um, using psychic powers. And here's an under-discussed paper that came out earlier this year on that same topic. In fact, it was a replication of some of the stuff in that um, Daryl Ben paper. Did anyone see this paper that, that came out? Perhaps there are people here who were involved. In, in this in this uh, study, the transparent psi project. So psi is what parapsychologists use to describe like the existence of psychic powers. And there's something out there that's anomalous that's not explained by uh, our current physics. And um, this is, I would put it to you, the the, the most rigorous study that I've ever seen in psychology uh, research. They um, they uh, 
it, it's a kind of an adversarial collaboration to some extent. That, that, that there are some people here who believe in the existence of psychic powers, and there are some people who don't. Uh, they agreed before the study started, and by the way, this is a registered report as well, they did all that sort of stuff, but they agreed on statements, like paragraphs, they would put in the uh, uh, conclusion section of their article if they found one result versus another, with the text written down so they couldn't mess around with it afterwards, or anything like that, it was all written down. Um, they, uh, obviously all the data are open, but it was also born open data. This is something which I feel was discussed a few years ago and then it never really kind of went anywhere, but here it is here. As soon as any data point was collected in this study, it was automatically posted online to a public website. So the authors of the study and anyone else in the world who happened to watch it would see this data immediately. So there's no chance of, you know, messing around with the data before you put it online, any kind of frauds, because obviously people have big questions about data manipulation fraud in this field because the results are so unbelievable. Psychic abilities, come on. Um, they did this, they did, um, they had an audit of all their code by an independent researcher, they had all sorts of stuff happening that, 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 that just doesn't happen in normal studies, or very, very rarely. Um, and by the way, they found those null results in the study. <laughs> Thank heavens, because I would have to change a lot of my views about how the world works, because seriously, the, 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 like, the outs the, were all closed off uh, by, by, by <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, you know, I would really, I, I would love to see it. And the question I have to ask is, if the parapsychologists can do it for research on psychic powers, why can't you, you know, why can't people who are doing, you know, everyday uh, uh, psychology research? Why, why can't we avoid becoming, like, basically zombies playing chess? And uh, that's my, that's really the, the, the end of my, uh, of, of my, uh, 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 talk. I'd love to hear any thoughts and questions you have. Thanks so much for listening. Questions? Sorry. Thanks to it. That was extremely entertaining. Um, I really enjoyed that. I, I had Three sort of thoughts and I, I like uh, reflections, I guess, um, on your talk and and what I've been hearing as well. I think what was highlighted to me is the importance of having a clear question at the outset of your study, and I think that doesn't happen nearly enough uh, in in research. We get excited about the analysis we're going to do and the newfangled whatever it is that we, we want to explore, or the conclusion that we want to come to, but setting out with that clear question um, and then that design focused approach. Yeah. Um, the other thing that, that occurred to me, and I'd like to get your thoughts as a, um, a psychologist um, and a genetic psychologist, but a psychologist nonetheless, um, how do we get rid of that ego and individualism in in research and I think um, yeah I think it, it's kind of forced us to forget what science is really about and not be skeptical of our own work and reflect on it and that humility but yeah yeah I think I think uh, you're frank but you're never going to be able to because humans are that's the way that's the way humans are so I think we have to see as much of our power to other mechanisms, whether that's uh, you know, whether that's writing stuff before you get the data, like they did in that psychology study, uh, sorry, that parapsychology study, um, whether that's uh, um, uh, doing you know, things like registered reports and stuff, and, and, and just tying your hands as much as you possibly can. Um, but I also think you know, we have to require that in, in, in so many cases because like, we have to be forced with it. So um, there are all these guidelines that lots of journals have. I mean, like ten years ago when I was you know first looking at these. Um, uh, replication questions. We didn't have the transparency and openness practice guidelines, and we didn't have registered reports of journals and so on. The problem is that we've seen over the years that um, what happens, I was talking to some people we went to dinner uh, I don't know, a few months ago, last year or something like that, a little time, um, uh, with people from who work at Elsevier, and they were saying that some tiny single digit percentage of articles that they publish are, are registered reports, you know, even when it could be. It could be much more. So we have to do a bit more requiring. We have to push funders and, and, and so on to just force people to tie their own hands or, 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 or physically tie their, tie their hands off. Literally, next one, tie their hands. And when they're, when they're doing their research. And, and um, uh, yeah, I think, I think unfortunately, I, I don't want, I, I, I kind of instinctively don't like the idea of, of 
you know, more rules and regulations and red tape and so on. But I think that's been really successful in, 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 some, in some ways. I think we could push further in that direction without impacting people's freedom of, you know, uh, um, inquiry. Thank you. Thanks, sir. I don't think there are any talker. I'm myself nodding more vigorously. Um, I, my question is around um, so clearly there are things that need to happen at a, at a leadership and structural level, right? Through the grant funding agencies and everything of, of how we evaluate um, yeah. the research that's going to be done. I guess my question is more about what we can, what can we do from the grassroots? Mm -hmm. um, so, it, sorry if I'm. My question is, uh, it takes too long to explain, but um, we're at uh, a new initiative in the University of Melbourne called the, the Melbourne Cloud Analytics Platform, where the idea is anybody from the fac from any faculty can come in with a research question and, and the domain expertise, and we help with the technical expertise. And this particular year, we found ourselves, uh, I found myself in a collaboration where um, it became very clear about six months into the collaboration that what was happening is uh, they were bringing us in to use technology to try to fix very poor experimental design. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is something that I didn't pick up when I read, read the application at the first yeah. time. Nobody did. Um, I think I feel like I'm exceptionally bad at knowing what's going to make a good research project and what's not. Um, but how can we better pick this up? Because then what I made, I made my objective of my contrib my contributions this collaboration be um, a, a paper where I. Um, explain all the things that, had, that could have been done differently uh, for the future. Like, if you want to do this again, try again. But and at the same time, my colleagues developed a, a whole sorts of very sophisticated technical um, tools that would help this um, experiment be done properly. Um, and as soon as I shared that with our collaborators, they ghosted us. <laughs> and so that's pretty much a year for me where I have no academic outputs from this because they kind of dropped the project. So I guess. We're, we're in a position where we can do something in our in the stage of selecting which projects we're going to support. Yeah. So how can we? Wow, it's, it's 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 really tricky. I'm sorry that happens uh, to you, but I, I um, it's a bit like that Ronald Fisher thing about you know, ask a statistician after the fact, um, yes. he can't tell you. You know, he can only tell you what the experiment died of. You know, it's, it's, it, it, it's not it's like a post mortem thing. Yeah. What you want is a statistician or the analytics person or whatever to come in and star and then go. Um, I think what you're doing in, in making things in making things easier is, is a big part of it. Brian Nosek had uh, that pyramid of how you change a culture, and at the top was things like make it require to do stuff. So like we're talking about the funders requiring you to do stuff and the journals requiring you to do stuff. But at the bottom, there's stuff about just making it easier to do it um, and uh, making it easier to use these these techniques. I went to a conference a few years ago. Um, for animal researchers, so non non human animal researchers, and they have built uh, and the, the, the big idea in that sort of research is that they don't want to use as many animals for, yeah. for, for ethical reasons. They don't yeah. use as many animals, rats, mice, whatever it is, as they previously have. Been. Um, so it's a three R's thing, you know, um, yeah. reduce, refine, replace, yeah. uh, and around. And what they have is a whole system online that makes it easy to plan uh, an experiment. That sure people have sorts of issues about, you know. It turns to fit into this particular template, but you can put in, you know, the sort of uh, sort of hypothesis you're interested in, and how many animals you think you'll need, and all that, and it plans out the whole design and everything for you. And the whole idea was, I'm sure it's at an early stage, but it's just trying to make things so easy because a reason, perhaps, that your collaborators were not interested in this was they felt that it was sort of the results just be difficult. It was just they, 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 or it doesn't have to change the way that they, they do the research. There's so much inertia. In this, and so a major important thing, as Brian was has pointed out, is that is, is making it easier for people to do things. Whether that's putting your data online, whether that's using these new uh, new LLMs or whatever it is to do the research, um, uh, and I think we've seen we, we saw that yesterday in your uh, uh, um, hackathon thing. With it's so much easier when you have the API and you have everything to to, to, to do research. With. So yeah, um, I don't know exactly you know how I would fix that situation, but um, but making but making it easy from the very start, I think. I have, I've had experiences where you, try, you suggest doing a registered report or you suggest putting the code online or whatever, and people are just like, oh, it sounds really hard. And, that, and that's such a big motivation. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Big fan of the your book, Science Fiction, for a family you read the book. Oh, wow. <laughs> And uh, your last two points, uh, collaboration and going yeah. over the top, we certainly want to do this, but as you know, that whole 
enterprise of universities fraud, right? Because we have a PhD student, three years, four years, yeah. three chapter we need to publish. So we need to think study, which can be done in 20 subjects, 20 animals. So, you know, whole, like, I've been thinking, like, what should we do for this student? Because it's the individualism, and this has to be individual's work. And, you know, how, what you said is compatible, you know, with yeah. this, you know, whole enterprise. And uh, is that one of the reasons you left academia? Or it's, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think um, yeah, and right in that book, I, in many ways, argued myself out of doing that. But yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I've been to a few different seminars where people put their hand up and said, you exactly refer to exactly the phenomenon you're talking about, which is my student needs to publish a paper. There's, we don't have resources to collect. 10,000 people, obviously, so we have to do a study in a few dozen, and that's just it. There's nothing we can do about it. So they end up producing low quality research, and that's just the the system. I think the kind of the open science movement, and there are a few different examples of people you know, collaborating, coming together and collaborating on the you know, many, many labs for projects and the many babies projects, and there's various other different ones. I think that's probably a way to go that if you can. Um, Combine lots of labs all doing a similar thing, but you also raise the issue of you know it needs to be one person that seems to be leading that. So, uh, but, but I'm sure it's not beyond the wit of, of, of academics to come up with you know different variations on it or uh, different uh, focuses of particular projects that that one person could sort of take over and run that aspect of it and really prove that they did a major you know they had a major part in the, in, in the project. But yeah, I, I think that's a that's a serious problem. It's happening. It's happening everywhere, right under our noses all the time. And it'd be nice if, in this very massively connected age, we could actually link people up and get to work together on things rather than laboring away, putting in all that effort into, you know, an N equals 20 study in neuroscience or something, where, you, you, again, you're just never going to be able to answer the question that you're uh, addressing. Hello. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'll go. Sorry, I'll please. <laughs> I've been very nice in my criticism for years and got nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm interested in. When you said the word ridicule, that really sprung to mind because I've wanted to do that in the past. So there yeah. is, you got any tips on how best to ridicule? Do you know what? Do you know what? I, th I thought about this uh, in various different contexts. I was, um, you know, being involved in, in, in various kind of um, things over the years. When I was an undergrad, I was in the new atheism movement. Like, how do you convince creationists not to believe in all that sort of stuff? And, uh, and, and, and I've, I'm now convinced that a plurality of, uh, uh, sorry, pluralism in a, in a approach is actually, is actually beneficial. There are some people who are going to absolutely hate it when you write a, you know, a, a, a satirical attack on social primary research or whatever it is and, and really trash it and, and make fun of it. Um, but there are also some people who are going to go, actually, that's a really good point. Um, but, but there's room for, there's room for other people to come along and say, you know, here's a very, you know, uh, Diplomatic critique and and, and 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 so on. So I actually think we need to encourage people from all different different uh, levels of aggro to, uh, to, to 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 criticize as much as they possibly can in their own in their own way. I went to a um, here's here's another way we can we can think about this. I went to an economics conference a couple of years ago uh, in, in, in in California. Well, it wasn't an economics conference. It was a, it was kind of psychology and genetics, but it, it was run by economists, so they did it their way. And has anyone been to an economics conference because when you do a talk, someone that does a talk directly after yours for five or ten minutes, that where they've been given access to your data, and they will try and check your findings and replicate it, or indeed trash it uh, if it's if it's bad. That's a very common uh, thing, and you do hear of like macho, aggressive questioners in economics, and it can become a very unpleasant environment and so on. So obviously, it can go too far in in, in, in the other direction. But I was amazed that like that level of just criticism is just built in. To the system of, of those conferences, um, and they have a much better system of. I think it was Christian Lee pointed out that you know when people do a talk at a conference, they present some data or whatever, and then the the, 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 the organizer says that was amazing. Thank you so much. Really, you know that, that was an incredible research. That disincentivizes anyone in the room to say actually I don't think it's incredible. Research. <laughs> uh, and it would be nice if we had you know an incentive like in those economic conferences where someone comes up and says thank you so much for giving me access to the data. After the analysis, couldn't find the same results, sorry. And obviously that's awkward, but I think, and I think when, I, when I look back at that book I wrote, Science Fictions, I think I underestimated the uh, um, 
how much of a motivator of people's behaviour uh, is social awkwardness and just not wanting to say things and, and, and be just clamming up and instead of instead of saying, sorry, senior person in my field, that's wrong. Uh, and I don't agree with that. And, and I, I don't know how we get around that except by building it into conferences and having that as a as a thing which we all we all just accept. And, and to, you know, to the same kind of thing in journals. Uh, so my question is, uh, so I'm a student at the moment, and yeah. uh, I'm going through my textbook, and there's like stuff about grit, and like yeah. laughing to myself that it hasn't been updated recently. But I realized that it's like, uh, like everyone in Australia is like being taught this, and like, how should we like teach students to like sometimes doubt the research that like yeah. is not being taught yeah. because we can't like always trust it, but. This is what we're like being taught. Like this is what we know. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I think, um, and it's a really big problem. Was that study uh, a few years ago of um, p values in psychology textbooks? You remember that? Eighty nine percent of psychology textbooks that they looked at had had um, the wrong definition of p values. <laughs> <in> the, like <laughs> incorrect <laughs> definition. Um, and and uh, so 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 there's that. But then there's also the like superseded research uh, stuff. All I can say is that we need to push research, um, we need to push textbook writers to change the way they do stuff. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm long-standing Twitter pals with uh, Neil Martin, who is one of the psychology textbook writers, uh, who writes a very popular like, a textbook called Psychology that most people use in undergrad. And he has now, in the book, updated post-replication crisis to have lots of sections that say, Here's research that didn't work out. You should be skeptical of this for this reason, X, Y, Z reason. You know, uh, uh, um, and so uh, I think there's a bit of pressure that we can put on, on text writers. You lecturers and so on should be buying the textbooks that have that kind of content in them, and, and, and actually incentivizing uh, the authors of those uh, books to 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 go and get it. Given the existing situation that we have, where there are things that have been superseded, yeah, I think we need. David and I used to run a critical thinking class at uh, Edinburgh University, um, and we used to do exactly this kind of thing in trying to give people the tools to critique research that they'd be taught in their classes. Um, and you know, it, there are some personalities that are that are more that come to that, but more that more disagreeable, or whatever that come to that more easily than others. But giving everyone the tools uh, to be more critical um, uh, is a big part of it, and it should be in every you know psychology. Uh, Class, that's the common bullshit class, or, or I mean, and I'm not just psychology, you be everywhere. Yeah. Okay, time for one more question. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, Hi. I really liked uh, the toothbrush problem that you mentioned. Yes. Um, something that I think about in like, drug development, which is a very different field, people have referred to the better than the Beatles problem. So, okay. you know that? Uh, explain. Yeah, so basically, it's kind of like once you get something that's pretty good. People yeah. go, oh, you know what, we've got that, it's pretty good. Let's not worry too much about that anymore. <laughs> to what degree do you think that sort of issue plays into what you're talking about? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a big part of that where, again, it's, it becomes inertia, doesn't it? Because it becomes well, that yeah. we use the same test. Uh, Alzheimer's research is an example of this. We use these tests to screen for Alzheimer's, which we then also say that the person taking the new drug, Lacanamab or Denanamab or whatever, has changed or their, their, their progression has of the disease has slowed by three points on the test. So no one really has any idea about what that means, but we've kind of reified three points difference in our minds that actually that now has become clinically clinically significant in, in, in some way. But actually there's loads of problems with that, and there's loads of problems with using those really quite blunt screening instruments, which uh, um, it's a bit like, you know, they, they don't have a high end, these, these screening instruments, so they don't, uh, it's a bit like saying, Someone who has always been five foot five, and someone who's been you know, who's, who's six foot something, um, and saying they have a, a, a defining that they've got a particular disease if they shrink to five foot exactly. But the person who is six foot has shrunk much more than the person who hasn't. But you haven't been able to pick that up on your on your on your test that you're using because it doesn't have a high end. It has the ceiling effect. So yeah, I think there's major problems with just. Relying on the same old tests, and it's why I really like it when people, um, even when it comes to things like the Big Five, where in the nineties and so on, you know, for personality, in the nineties there was a big push for everyone to be using this uh, test. But I've, I've seen recently some people questioning this, and, and you know, whether it's six factors or whether it's something else entirely, um, and, and starting to develop uh, more stuff on that, and, and, and more power to them because 
We should always be, we should never be sitting still and resting on our laurels on this particular big five inventory because there's a lot more research than that. It doesn't explain everything about people's personalities. We've got to do, we've got to do better. So, um, yeah, I think, I think inertia is a major problem in this, in this uh, era with, with measures uh, as well.